the scapula. This is the scapula, also known as the shoulder blade. The one which is used for filming is from the left side. Scapula is flat, triangularly shaped bone that sits on the superior posterior aspect of the thorax. As one can see, the main part of the bone is practically transparent as the bone is quite thin, whereas the scapular margins appear to be more solid and thick. Let's find out what are anatomically relevant details that this bone can offer to us. This is the dorsal view to the bone. As one can see when we slowly rotate the bone, the dorsal aspect of the bone is slightly convex in the posterior direction, whereas the anterior side or costal side of the bone is slightly concave in order to ensure better adherence to convexity generated by the posterior thoracic wall. Scapular main part being triangular will demonstrate three different margins and three different angles. This is superior border of the scapula. This is medial scapular or paravertebral border. When these two borders intersect they form the superior scapular angle. Third margin of this bone is oriented laterally. For that reason it is known as the lateral or axillary border of the scapula. Intersection between paravertebral border and axillary border yields another angle which is termed the inferior angle of the scapula. Although the superior angle and the inferior angle of the scapula were quite easy to identify, the third angle, which is referred to as the lateral angle, appears to be somewhat mysterious. It's really not angular in the first place because intersection of the superior border and axillary border cannot really yield an angle but rather becomes heavily modified in order to form this huge articular surface that is called the glenoid cavity or the glenoid fossa. Therefore the entire part of the scapula that I'm currently pointing to is what should be referred as the lateral scapular angle forming the glenoid cavity or the glenoid fossa. There is a massive bony ridge which arises from the medial or vertebral border of the scapula which is known as the scapular spine. It projects itself laterally and as it reaches the shoulder it actually bends forward. So what we see here is first the spine of the scapula with its root, then the spine which really divides the dorsal aspect of this bone into two large depressions. Above the spine comes the supraspinous fossa and inferior to the spine of the scapula is another large area known as the infraspinous fossa. When the spine of the scapula reaches the most lateral part it forms the angle before it terminates creating this huge part that is named as the acromion of the scapula. Word acromion is coming from the Greek term acros and poomus that is a Latin term acro on the top of omus being shoulder so acromion is really the top of the shoulder. The acromion itself will show us facet, articular surface, that will be used to make the joint between the acromion and the lateral clavicular end, the acromioclavicular joint. The supraspinous fossa contains practically the same name muscle. The name of the muscle is supraspinatus, whereas infraspinous fossa is gonna host attachment of also large and important muscle that is known as the infraspinatus. On the costal side or anterior side the scapula 
and its blade is slightly concave. So this area will become attachment of subscapularis muscle. Supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and the subscapular muscle are joined by another muscle, the teres minor, and they form rotator cuff around the glenohumeral joint. These four muscles with their flat, broad tendons actually reinforce the glenohumeral joint that would otherwise rely on a very few ligaments. If we take a closer look at the glenoid fossa or glenoid cavity, we would realize the moment we compare it to the size of the head of the humerus that they are not a perfect match. Glenoid fossa is very slightly concave and it almost looks like a flat articular surface. In a living person, it will be additionally enlarged and made wider and also made more concave by attachment of fibrocartilaginous ring all around its peripheral margins. The name of that ring is glenoid labrum. Inferior to the glenoid fossa, there is area of substantial roughness that is known as the infraglenoid tubercle. That is the attachment of the long head of the triceps brachii muscle. Superior to the glenoid cavity, there is another much smaller elevation that is known as the supraglenoid tubercle that is also attachment of the long head of the biceps brachii muscle. Finally, we need to identify this projection that arises with its base from the superior margin of the scapula close to the glenoid fossa. Its name is the coracoid process. The coracoid process makes significant projection forward relative to the rest of the scapula and as such actually projects itself further anterior relative to the position of the clavicle. The coracoid process is interesting attachment point for three different muscles, the pectoralis minor, the coracobrachialis, and it is also attachment of the short head of the biceps brachii muscle. As it was mentioned earlier, the scapular blade is quite thin, almost transparent, whereas the peripheral parts of the bone are much thicker. Additional muscles will use the margins of the scapula for their attachment. So on this costal surface, on the top of what was said that subscapular fossa will be the attachment of the subscapularis muscle, on this lateral edge or axillary border of the scapula, as well as on the medial or paravertebral border of the scapula, we're going to have attachment of additional number of muscles, both on the costal or anterior side, as well as on the dorsal or posterior side of the scapula. To name a few, the medial border of the scapula will become attachment point for rhomboid minor and then rhomboid major muscle, whereas on the same landmark, on a different side of the bone, it will become attachment point for the serratus anterior muscle.